real-time networks as opposed to single base positioning and our approach toward them. You're going to see a little bit of head scratching here this afternoon because we're fighting our way through this thing and, and how it's very and very important. Real-time networks are very important to the access to the National Spatial Reference System. And it's, it's important that things fit together. So obviously, uh, you can see that certainly in the Gulf Coast, you know, where emergency routes and, and GIS systems would have to fit together to match. You're dealing with some areas that are very flat. Elevations are very important. Very important for the whole country. So we talked about a little bit about in 10 years. You know, we said 10 years is going to be 115 satellites and everything. And we'll have uh, autonomous position, you know, to a couple decimeters or something. But in 10 years, to complicate things, we're going to have new datums, too. New national datums. NAT 83 is going to go away. And I say 10 years, the projected date, as you heard, was 2022. We could actually do the geometrical datum now if we wanted to. We could. But the thing is, why do we want to roll out a new geometrical or horizontal datum and then everybody start to get on board with that and then roll out another datum a few years later? So the best thing to do is be to make that big change because, remember, NAD83 has had a bunch of adjustments. And we're going to go through another adjustment of the core system, which is going to reflect in the passive marks as well. Not a big change. Not a big change. A couple centimeters, you know. Things like that can be lost in the noise of a real-time solution. When those new datums come around, though, you're going to be seeing a meter, a meter and a half, that sort of thing. That's going to be a big change. So we'll talk a little bit about that just so that you understand the importance of real-time networks in that scenario. And again, just to reemphasize, moving away from labor toward technology, you know, moving away from measuring things with people to measuring things remotely. And I think we'll see a lot more of that. The different, uh, different datums we run across. We talked, remember this morning we talked about WGS-84 as our GPS datum that our system is based on. That's one of the datums we run into, okay. And we use 983 for most of our work nationally and locally because our state plane coordinates are based on NAT 83. That is our official national datum, right? The thing is, a lot of states have built that into their annotated code. For instance, Maryland <laughs> and a lot of other states. What's going to have to happen when we go to that new datum, and I'm glad Ronnie's sitting there. Do we have a tentative name for these new datums yet, Ronnie? Do you know? Yeah. I mean, I didn't know what to call it, so I just call it NAD22, you know. I mean, that'll be the new datum that's coming out around 2022. Yeah, what well, we'd like to, uh, just so emphasize, we're working with Canada, and also we've been talking to Mexico about having a common American. Okay. So it may transcend just the United States. Canada, Mexico, maybe a combined date. I could see that very easily happen. But anyway, that'll be a new datum. And then the scientific guys, the International Terrestrial Reference System. You know, uh, WGS-84 has migrated from originally being very close to this origin to the International Terrestrial Reference System datum. So these datums we run into. And then vertically, everybody knows the FEMA datum uh, <laughs> of 29. And NAVD-88, our official vertical datum. I think that FEMA will move to 88 whenever we move to the new datum in 2022. <laughs> And then, of course, as we work, we don't usually work in the field with latitude, longitude, ellipsoid height. We usually work in state plane coordinates or some kind of mapping projection coordinates. So we use them. You know, Universal Transverse Mercator, Army uses that worldwide. And, and we can establish our own low distortion projection as well as state plane. So anyway, we run into this sort of stuff, right? This is what we typically run into now. So here's our, our datum again with the XYZ laid on top of it. So we can measure XYZ to any point on, under, or above the Earth. Any point, this could even be a satellite, you know, XYZ. Um, in that sense, it's very easy to maintain. 
And then what we do is, for Anatomy 3, we talk about longitude, latitude, and this new dimension, which now becomes a three-dimensional datum, ellipsoid height, right? So now our old two-dimensional datums now are, is now a geometrical or three-dimensional datum based on this reference surface. Here's the trouble. Anatomy 3 was done and, you know, built in the early 80s and everything, before, kind of before GPS came along. And it used a lot of conventional methodology, as well as some other things, some satellite uh, information, it wasn't GPS, and to be a, kind of the first global datum. And they nailed it pretty well. They did pretty well. The trouble was, essentially, the origin is a couple meters off from where true geocenter is, true center of mass of the Earth. Satellites don't orbit two meters off the center of the Earth. They orbit the center of the Earth, center mass of the Earth. So the scientific guys came along later, and they said, well, we, we have a lot of methodologies we can use. We can use very long baseline interferometry, these big satellite dishes you see to get the quasar signals. And they used uh, Doppler orbitography and radio positioning integrated on satellite, the DARIS data. And they used satellite laser ranging, and they used GPS. And they came up with a really good realization that nailed the center mass of the Earth to a few centimeters. Okay. Meanwhile, Natity 3 is over here somewhere. So this is what's going to happen in 2022 or whatever date that happens to be. We're going to move this over to be the geocenter of the Earth, defined to a certain epic or realization of this international terrestrial reference frame the realization of the ITRS at some epoch of time, okay? Once we do that, a decision has to be made. Are we going to do like Natity 3 and fix it on the North American plate so everybody's kind of moving together, or are we just going to tag it with velocities and let it go relative to the worldwide data, ITRS? And, and then everything would have to have a velocity, and you'd have coordinates du jour, like they do in California. So that's the decision that has to be made there. I think it's fair to say that most of the thinking is we should maybe lock it to the North American plate again at some epic of time. I think that's fair to say, wouldn't you say, Ronnie? So we don't know yet, but we think that's probably the way it'll go. I don't know if Jerry's still here or not. Mark, you, would you agree with that? I would. Okay. So here's the difference. You know, you've got two different, remember this geometrical comp component now, this ellipsoid height. All of a sudden, we've got pretty big differences in this ellipsoid height. Now, there's also a horizontal component to that. And we don't see a lot of this right now as we're walking around autonomously because, what, we're three, five meters, right? Well, in 10 years from now, remember, we're going to be like this. You would see that as you're walking around. You would see that differences. So... In Louisiana, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Apologize. So what's going to happen is that these differences will be taken out at some epoch of time. ITRF, reference frame of the ITRS, will continue to be tagged with velocities. It will continue to move according to those velocities. NAD 22, or whatever you want to call it, will be fixed to the plate as we're thinking right now. So the velocities will be similar to our NAD83 velocities, which are close to zero in a lot of places. Okay, so that's what's going to happen with a new datum. What's going to happen with the current adjustment of NAD83, same datum, NAD83, just a different adjustment. And that's what's coming out in July, probably. And that's going to be NAD83 2011. It's a cores adjustment. A lot of reasons for that. We don't really have to get into them now, but it's much better. Uses a lot of different things, absolute antenna heights, things like that. So just to show you, if you took that datum adjustment, which is going to be in 2010.0, and said, well, where, where would that new adjustment be in, in where our datum is now, which is 2002.0, this is the difference in those two. So here's horizontal. These are some of the cores, by the way. And this is vertical. And here's your, your standard measurement. That is one centimeter, if you can see that little blue arrow. 
So you can see, eh, no big deal. Vertically, well, of course, vertically, down, up, down, up, you know. So you're going to see some movement there, or uh, some uh, difference there. Now, if you take the same thing, only we'll take this guy and move him to the datum epoch, epoch of 2010.0, okay, versus the, our present NAD 83 adjustment, 2000, uh, cores 96 epoch 2002. This is the difference horizontally. So here's the point. The point is the adjustment, a large component of the, of the adjustment is because we're moving the epoch eight years from 2002 to 2010. Okay, so that's, that's really a large component of why, why uh, you're looking at this kind of difference versus this kind of difference. Okay, and vertically. So that's going to be the adjustment coming out in 2000, uh, in, in January, <laughs> July, <laughs> and near January, like in maybe December, who knows. There'll be actually an adjustment of the passive marks, the marks in the ground, in this adjustment, 93-2011. Okay, they will uh, be published at that time. Remember now our passive marks, when you bring up the NGS data sheet, you'll usually see NAD 83, 2007. That's usually what you see now. That's very close to the, the CORES adjustment, CORES 96, 2002. Kind of close, very close. The trouble with the passive marks, even when we readjust them, is that we're basing them on original observations. No new observations because everything's already in the database, all the computations and the, and the data is in the database, the observation, uh, data, observational data. So we don't know where the marks are now. We just, we're going to reobserve their values, uh, redefine, re readjust their values. Excuse me. The vertical part of this, the vertical datum, this is the exciting part to me. It's going to enable us and this even augments the importance of real-time networks. It's going to enable us to define, because of the GravD stuff going on and things, other things, to define a vertical datum that's going to be a true gravimetric equipotential datum rel uh, accurate to about a centimeter, one centimeter. Pretty darn good. And that means we can take that, go anywhere that has that coverage, bring the national vertical datum to our site, allowing for some GPS error to maybe two centimeters. We can bring what's going to be the equivalent of NAVD 88, which will be what, NAVD 22 or something, to our site to within two centimeters using this, the antennas in the air, not the marks in the ground. NAVD 88 is defined and propagated by leveling from marks in the ground, benchmarks. NAD 83 is defined and propagated by antennas in the sky. They both will come together with a new datum. And the passive marks, uh, again, they get wiped out, they get disturbed, we don't know anything about them when you walk away from them. Can we re-level them? Well, we could if you got a couple billion dollars. We could do that. But then when you walk away again, you're back where you started. You don't know what happens to them. So this is, to me, is very exciting, very exciting. It's going to enable us to bring the vertical part of that datum, which we all have problems with now, um, uh, real-time networks. We see that. I've, had, I've talked to two or three people just today, you know, talking about the vertical part of this thing. We can bring it to two centimeters to our site. Very exciting. Ten years, I hope to be in a beach somewhere. But there's a lot of young people in here that are going to enjoy that, I think. Hopefully so. The GRAVD program, Gravity for the Redefinition of the American Vertical Datum, uh, is the key to that, of course. The, the thought is this. Get a high accuracy snapshot of everything. All right? So then we got a, a really good gravity snapshot. And then take areas like southern Louisiana, California, you know, uh, southern Alaska, the Great Lakes, somewhere like that, and, and make more like a movie out of it. Keep it updated of, these, of, of the areas that have more dynamics than 
say, the East Coast or something. So you have a really high start, and then you continue to monitor the gravity in these areas. It doesn't change overnight, but it, it will change more rapidly than, than, than certain uh, more high stability areas. So no gravity, no heights. No gravity, no heights. Okay. So all that is coming. I think it's pretty exciting. Louisiana, uh, some core stations here. Look at, uh, this is just two examples, but it's the same everywhere. This is the ITRF 2000 EPIC 1997 datum on that station, okay? You can see the values. See the ellipsoid height, minus 1.501. And remember, you can be below the, the ellipsoid. You know, you're below the ellipsoid in most of the places here, aren't you, Roy? So you're, you're minus one and a half meters on this station. The, the Nanity 3 ellipsoid, ellipsoid height is minus 0.11. So it's about 1.391 meters different or something like that. That'll go away with the new datum. But right now, it's quite a bit of difference, isn't it? Remember that difference in the origin. That's what's giving us that. And then difference in the, the uh, XYZs are different, latitude, longitude. But look at the velocities. Uh, this is the ITRF velocity. How come that has a velocity like that, you know, in each XYZ and these components? It's because uh, that datum is a worldwide datum based on the average motion of all the crustal plates in the world and the, and the Earth orientation parameters. So, whereas 983 is fixed on the plate. That's why the velocities are zero. Essentially, they're saying this point does not move relative to 983. It has no velocity. That's what it's saying. You look at this next point, same thing. I mean, you can see the minus ellipsoid heights. You see the difference here? 1.391 meters between 983 and ITRF. But look here, this, this point actually has 983 velocities assigned to it. So some points are moving relative to the datum and very close by. Some are, supposedly. So again, NAVD-88 is realized from passive marks. NAVD-3 is realized from antennas in the air. National cores are the truth. Cores are the truth. Um, OK. So we'll access the datum through active stations for both vertical and horizontal. Passive marks, uh, wouldn't use that one probably, right? Sometimes you need a search party to find it. Hard to access. I think there's some actually like that, aren't they? In the underwater, though, down here. Uh, no ties to recover it. And sometimes they're just missing. And I think that is Roy's basement, by the way. Okay, so the core system are the truth. <laughs> yeah, C O O R S. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so 17 to 1800 cores, I don't know. Does anybody know the exact count now? It's up near 1800, I think. Anyway, um, in, the, in the new adjustment, why did they only use 1,250 of them? Well, because those are the ones they know the vertical velocities on, and actually the horizontal velocities as well, because they've been there more than two and a half or three years. So that's why they use those guys and not all the rest that are newer, because the newer ones are just assigned a model velocity and no vertical velocity at all, matter of fact. So they use them to know where things are really moving. Now, 1,800 core stations, 200 people that are partners or stakeholders, if you will, in the core system with their own antennas and their own stations. NGS owns, I don't know, 30-some, 30 35 stations or something. All the rest of them are other people. But there are other federal agencies as well. What happens if all those guys, you know, take their antennas and go home? You know, we don't have any infrastructure anymore. So the idea is to build out a very, very sparse but very, very high accuracy infrastructure of foundation cores that are going to be aligned to the scientific community as well as we can and co-located with their means of, uh, you know, establishing their parameters, which will be the VLBI, the satellite laser ranging, 
Doris, all the rest. They're not all going to have that, obviously. But there may only be 10, 12 super cores, if you will, foundation cores in the United States. That'll be the basis for our datum. Now, we have to work through our ideas, too, because our idea right now is to stream data from those guys, you know, those 12 stations. Um, we'll have to work through that. But one thing we won't do ever, real time, certainly, is to provide correctors from any of them. The, the intent, certainly, is not to in any way uh, have the appearance of competing with, with industry at all. Don't want that to happen. So anyway, that's going to be built out. Uh, then you'll have this magic, not magic, but it'll be a high accuracy scientific reference network of super cores. Now, so you're with me now. We've got all this new technology coming around. We've got new datums that'll be in place. What we're looking at is kind of like this. We'll have a project, right? And we'll have some existing marks around. Maybe we've used them in the past. Maybe we don't know a whole lot about them. But we're going to have new project control. And we're going to have some vertical control, too. So we have to make a choice right now. Right now, we have to make a choice. Are these the truth? Is the real-time network the truth? Is the cores the truth? Are all of them the truth? We have to make that decision. In the future, the truth to the datum will be the, the active stations. But we have to decide now, are these the truth? In the future, we'll have the cores network around here. So if we do calibrate, we'll do that. So we'll have a cores system somewhere out there. There'll be national cores, if you will let me use that terminology. And there'll be the geometrical and geopotential truth. All right? The thing is, the thing is, Sitting in between them and our project, there'll, there'll be a lot of, throughout the country, there'll be a lot of real-time networks that's going to sit in between your project and the core system. They may be spaced 70 kilometers. They may be spaced 100 kilometers. Uh, right now, a lot of them are state-to-state, -state, the DOTs, but there's also real-time networks that run through 12 states in the eastern seaboard, from Virginia to Maine. There's a one real-time network that, that ha covers that area. Washington State Reference Network is an amalgamation of counties, the city of Seattle, the PANGA, Pacific Northwest G GPS Array, and PBO, and there's the DOT, and it's just an amalgamation of all these different little networks put together. They're all sitting between our project and the truth. It's very important that these guys are aligned to the truth, the National Spatial Reference System. People are going to be using them day in and day out. Why? Well, it's bang for the buck. I mean, it, doesn't, it doesn't take long to get a real-time position, as long as you can trust it, right? The cost of the network is using it is, is inconsequential almost to what you're going to get, get out of it. So their space may be 70 kilometers. People will be using them to access the National Spatial Reference System. We want to make sure that that represents the National Spatial Reference System to a certain level. We're thinking two centimeters horizontal, maybe four centimeters ellipsoid height. That's what we're thinking. If we can get everybody to those, within those parameters, I think we would be happy. It would mean everybody's aligned to the datum to that level, more or less. Here's, uh, well, I'll talk about the coordinates. But the thing about the NGS, if people are going to be accessing data in real time from whatever source and they're dealing in centimeters, we have to provide data in millimeters. We have to be better than what you get out of it. It's just entropy happens, you know. So we provide latitude, longitude, elevation, spatial data, models, and tools, and a coastline, of course. So we have to do things to a millimeter. And that's a little scary in itself, I think. The situation with real-time networks, as of March anyway, uh, in the country, and this is not really good color here, but if you will, draw a line down the west side of Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, Arkansas, and Louisiana. 
Everything to the east of that is covered by a real-time network. And there are some blank areas, of course. That was Roy's house up here, I think. And, but there's some, you're seeing what you're looking at here is anywhere there's a blue, well, this is supposed to be blue, or a blue stripe, is a public network available, mostly statewide, okay. Uh, in most cases, DOT. Anything that is red, like Georgia, uh, Maryland, you know, things like that are private networks. And there's some differences. There's some, there's some municipalities in these states, you know, Albuquerque, things like that, that have their own little RTN. But look at the, uh, look at the people that are playing in these real-time networks. You know, it's anything you can think of. And Roy pointed out precision agriculture, huge, huge use of, of real-time positioning. Machine guidance, huge much bigger than surveying and engineering. So these are things that are coming online. They're using centimeters like we do. There you go. 107, uh, my, my Uber boss, Neil Weston, uh, actually not the Uber boss, he's the middle boss. Ronnie's my Uber boss. But uh, anyway, he, he asked me to see if I can count up how many real-time networks there were in the United States. It wasn't easy because of all those amalgamations and things like that, but I came up with 107. So we got at least 107 of them, I think, in the country. 200 worldwide, and maybe about 35 of the 50 states DOTs are running a real-time or planning a real-time network. So you can see the importance of that. All these people, though, the municipalities, the uh, the geodetic surveys, manufacturers, Roy pointed out, and that's a good point. The actual GNS manufacturers are running their own real-time networks around the country. Kind of interesting, I think. They're, I guess they're trying to fill in the blanks, basically, but interesting to see them uh, in, the, in the mix. Okay. I guess this is kind of a drop-back slide, but this is just to reemphasize the utility of a real-time network. This is single base, right? Probably a lot of you recognize that situation. Tripod, antenna, receiver, battery to run the receiver, data cable, radio, battery to run the radio, antenna mast, tripod to hold the antenna mast. And you gotta set all that up. What, do you ask, what else do you have to do? You have to find the point to sit on. You have to recover it. Sometimes that's not easy. Um, and then, you know, you need Fred. Fred is here to guard the receiver to make sure it's not stolen. You know. And, uh, <laughs> all right. When, again, private industry serving engineering, young guy, and uh, he didn't know, m you know much yet, so we left him to be Fred, you know, by the, by the base station. And we went off and did some work. And we were done, and we rode by, and he was asleep, just like Fred there. And so we pulled in the parking ride, and, and we, 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 we took all the equipment and put in the truck. And we rode down a little bit, and we called him up. Yeah, Pete, we're done. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes to get the equipment. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Oh! <laughs> so we had to bring him a change of underwear, too. But <laughs> So anyway, you don't need Fred with a real-time network. You, know. you, can, you can take Fred, give him a pole, and you just doubled your production. Or let Fred do something else, and you've cut your equipment cost in half because you don't need this stuff. So that's, you know obviously a good reason for a real-time network. All you need is this, the rover. Uh, part per million error is related to single base, you know, whether it's active or marking the ground. Real-time network gives you an interpolated solution. It removes the first order part per million error. That's one good thing. It's very good. Uh, it enables you to go further, uh, and it's just m more bang for the buck, okay? There's no monument recovery. Another thing, Think about this, in 2022, or whenever we roll out these new datums, if you want to work and you're thinking, man, I got all this stuff here, but I need the new datum, what am I going to do? You're working in a real-time network, Roy has to sit down and put all of his stations in the new datum. But once he does that, you're walking around in the new datum. You don't have to do anything, except dial into Roy and GolfNet. And Randy, I'm sorry, Randy Osborne back there. So it, it, you know, enables you to work in the datum without you doing any work. Roy. One other point. If, uh, if you don't have a benchmark that's valid to put your, uh, your base station on, then you're going to have to spend an enormous amount of time to collect enough data on that temporary benchmark so that you can compute your, your position. 
Sure. Yep. If you have no mark in the ground, then you're going to have to establish something. And when these new datums come out, arguably, we probably have eliminated our need for high stability passive marks because we can reestablish them from the truth using active control in the sky. Horizontal, great from an RTN usually. Generally speaking, horizontal is great. Vertical, you need to localize. That's where we're using the passive marks, right? So we're localizing the passive marks that we call the truth. New datum, truth is from the active station, so we don't have to do that anymore. This is very important, and Roy mentioned this, the business model. It's important for the administrator, and it's important for the user, because uh, you have to decide what works for you. The administrator has to get recoup the cost of running the network, but there's different scenarios. With, uh, there's a, in Maryland, uh, there was a scenario that has since changed, but one of the manufacturers said, look, you, you give me some electricity and an internet connection, I'll come up, I'll, it's our equipment, I'll set our equipment up on your roof or wherever it is, and for free, just do that. The catch was, you had to use their equipment to work in the network, so it was proprietary data. Another one said, look, um, you know, you've got to buy the equipment if you want to play. We'll, we'll help you set it up, but you get to share in the revenue. And the more stations you put up, the more you share in the revenue. So there's another business model. So you've got to decide what works for you. Uh, some of the things that people like Roy and, and Randy worry about are, is this stuff. Uh, the most, one of the most important things is the information technology. The communication. It's not about coordinates in a real-time network. It's about getting the IT people to work with you. It's not always an easy thing. Um, we really talked about integrity monitoring. What data do you provide and in what format? These are some of the decisions that have to be made. The spacing is very important of the network. When it first started out, they would space them maybe like 30 kilometers apart, 18 miles apart. And then as things progressed and things got better, they started stretching them out to 50 kilometers, now 70 kilometers. You know, Europe has some 100 kilometers. So you can see what's happening. The modeling's, modeling is getting much better. And this is from Gavin Schrock, actually from Washington State Reference Network. Consider 120 by 120 square area miles. And if you were planning a real-time network and you did 30 kilometer spacing, you need about 46 stations. If you did 70 kilometer, excuse me, 70 kilometer spacing, you'd only need 14. So that's about a million dollars or more difference in cost. So that, see how important that planning is. You have to sort of anticipate what's going to happen. And you may only want to build out to where you really need it to begin with. Thing is, when you build 10 stations, around an area where you first need it, you're doing an adjustment of those stations or whatever you're doing to get a coordinate. Then later on you're thinking, oh my gosh, we really need to build this out. So you add another 10 stations. Well, guess what? You've got to do another adjustment. <laughs> Coordinates change. How much do they change? I don't know. When do you change the coordinates of the stations? Those are big deals for the administrator. Okay, the guy in the field, you don't have to read this, just, you know, you can hit a couple of them. This is what the guy in the field has, to, the guy or girl in the field has to know. That stuff. So again, what we want to do at NGS is make sure these real-time networks are aligned to our national datums at some level. It doesn't have to be to the millimeter, you know, we're thinking two and four, remember. Uh, we, want, we would love to have everybody be able to work in every network with any kind of equipment there is. One way to do that is to encourage the use of RTCM data, which is open, generic format. You can get RT, uh, the, the transport software is NTRIP, Network Transport of RTCM via Internet Protocol. Freely available uh, for client and for server. Um, we would like them to meet the criteria for stability and, and 
the, of the regular cores, if you're setting up a cores to be a uh, nationwide cores, then the guidelines are here for that, that uh, Dr. Giovanni Sella was a primary author of. And those are for establishing a new core station. Roy had to go through all that when he did his core stations. And, of course, we want the best methods to be doing. So that's what we're after. The big thing is this, National Spatial Reference System. These are network RTN guidelines that are out in draft form now for public comment. That means you. So this is the link to it. I'll have it later as well. About 60 different people contributed to this, um, including our NGS advisors, the spatial reference centers, the DOTs, uh, the manufacturers, GNS manufacturers. So we had a lot of people playing in this, and it was a lot like herding cats, but we got something out the door anyway. There's uh, five sections, site considerations, planning, administration. Very important chapter by uh, uh, a retired uh, director of the spatial reference system, Dr. Richard Snay, on aligning RTN to the NSRS. Very important. That will be a very dynamic chapter as we work through how we want to approach this. But right now, uh, it's, it's worth reading, I think. And then I did the user section. One way to look at this, and uh, I'm not saying this is the way we want to go. I'm just saying it's one way to look at it. Dr. Snay says, you know what, if you had a network say GolfNet, and you had enough cores, national, if, if you don't mind me saying national cores, we was, cores is our terminology, but a lot of people use cores as any active station. I'm going to say national cores. If you, if you have enough national cores in that network, say 3 or 10 percent of the stations, whichever is greater, you know, so if you had, you know, 30 stations, you need three of them. If you had eight stations, you need three of them. So 3 or 10 percent. And if you did that, then you could use one of the uh, NGS tools, one of the Opus tools, an Opus-like tool, say Opus Projects or something like that that Mark talked about yesterday. And you could generate coordinates of all the other stations in that real-time network just using those national cores in that network that are both in the network and national cores. So you have an immediate tie to the National Spatial Reference System. So if you did that, you know, and then you could generate like a core's 60-day plot or something. And you could see immediately if there's any biases. So that was his idea. He thought maybe we, could, maybe we could do that. I think we talked about this pretty much. So the concern is this. If you have a situation in the, in the country and you have something like Ohio with a Trimble network and, you know, Indiana and with a Leica, Michigan with a Leica and... Kentucky with a Trimble, and, you know, I think I have an example in Maryland. We've got four different networks in Maryland, three different kinds of GNSS uh, manufacturers. You know, and you work on the borderline, you want to use both networks, or, you, you know, you use one, then you use the other. Do you get the same answer? Well, it's important that you do within certain parameters. How would you put coordinates on your stations in a real-time network? Well, there's a lot of different ways, and every one of those ways is done somewhere in the country, I can guarantee it. Again, I'm going to refer to Dr. Snay. He recommends using our cores, the national cores, what's ever in the national cores system. But he also recommends not fixing all the coordinates rigidly. And here's why. Right now on our cores network, there's a little bit of play, a couple centimeters floating around. A real-time network has to be very, very, very precise coordinate-wise internally, whether it's accurate or not. It has to be very precise because if it's not accurate coordinate-wise and you hold the coordinates, the strain in that adjustment has to go somewhere and it's slopped into the atmospheric modeling and you get bad atmospheric modeling. So it has to be very precise. We'd like to see that aligned to the National Spatial Reference System via the cores network. So he says, why don't we weight the cores? Why don't we say one centimeter in each horizontal position and two centimeters ellipsoid height? Let it float a little bit. You've still got it aligned to the NSRS within a couple centimeters, and you've got a very precise adjustment for the real-time network. So that's, that's his thoughts on it. However, I mean, there's, you know, obviously 
the man, uh, the, anybody that runs a real-time network, and, uh, and Roy will tell you, will uh, adopt the cores data. Uh, they'll uh, probably fix the cores and do an adjustment. Or when Michigan, for instance, started out, they just got a bunch of Opus solutions, maybe 10 days of data or something, and they used them as seed coordinates for all their stations and did an adjustment. That's what they did. So there's different ways, different approaches. It's none of our authority to tell anybody how to do anything, but we're just trying to promote the alignment to the National Spatial Reference System in whatever manner might work. And we can do that by recommending. We can't dictate anything, of course, but we can, we can say, well, you know, th you're aligned to the National Spatial Reference System within a few centimeters, that's good. You know, why don't you use our NGS logo and say you're, you are? That might be a nice little carrot to hang out there. I don't know. But this is one of the things we're working through. How about movement? Very important. Right now, we have a model, horizontal time-dependent positioning. I'm really looking forward to the day when we'll have a 3D model. So we'll also have vertical modeling, too. Um, after three years, you know where, at least you have an idea how it's moving. The trouble is, movement isn't always... Uh, uniform, up and down, and it changes, as Roy said earlier. So we're hoping for a 3D model, and that'll give us a, a nice, nice handle on velocities of stations. In Maryland, this is what I was alluding to, I should have moved these up a little bit, uh, four networks, four real-time networks in, in my state. There's two Topcon networks, a Leica network, and a Trimble network. And the one covers the eastern shore, and the one is, cover, this, these two are the top con. This covers the whole state ostensibly. Uh, this is a Trimble network, KeyNet. That's the one that goes actually from Virginia to Maine. And there's a, a Leica, actually run by Leica <clears throat> in, in, in that area. So these four guys um, hopefully give you the same answer. I mean, there, there was a situation where we had a gentleman um, actually go through and test all four of them on points, you know, published points from the, from the database. He found, uh, this was a couple of years ago, he found that some of them hit very well, you know, you'd hit a couple hundreds horizontally and four hundredths uh, of a foot uh, vertically, and then he hit one, it was 300 feet out horizontally, you know, and eight feet out vertically, you know, so the consistency wasn't there. I hope that's been resolved by now. But uh, I'm not going to say which network it was or where the problem was, but I, hopefully it's been resolved. That's one of our concerns. You know, it's, I'm not sure where the liability rests in that, but I think most real-time networks, and I'm sure Roy would say the same thing, caveat emptor. It's up to you, baby. So it's your, it's your seal, so you've got to make sure it's right. Uh, okay, more smart net stuff. Um, English turn in New Orleans. Uh, the new cores adjustment, by the way, will use the same parameters. It'll, in 983, it'll stay the same coordinate unless we see it move more than two centimeters uh, horizontally and four centimeters vertically. So, but this is interesting. This is uh, a couple of years ago. But English turn subsiding maybe six millimeters a year that we saw. And over this span of time, it subsided more than four centimeters. But, the, the, but the, the published elevation didn't change right away. So if you went out and used the, uh, the published elevation of English turn and tried to get elevations from there, you were immediately starting four centimeters out without even doing anything. So this is the problem. Um, the new datum will actually be better that way. New datum, new adjustment, excuse me. So here's one of the, here's a quandary uh, for the administrators. When do you change the coordinates of your stations? A lot of real-time networks are so new, it hasn't really been an issue yet. But over time, of course, they're moving. You know, if you don't have an accurate picture of how they're moving, or if you add to the network and have to do a readjustment, when do you change the coordinates? If the antenna isn't in the same spot, you're not getting the right answer, right? if you have the same coordinate on it. So how much, you know, understanding that there's a couple centimeters of slop in any solution from that network, you know, you can't, real-time positioning is a great tool, but it is a tool. 
Uh, what you'll do in your project sites in the future, you'll bring the datum in, but you'll do very precise work with geodetic leveling and, and other means to tighten it up. Okay. I love to show this picture. I just have to put it up every time. It's, it's great. This is where the ground was in 1957 in Maricopa County. This is where it is in 1991. And here's Central Valley, California. This is where the ground was in 1925. And this is where the ground was in 1977. This is very typical of the movement in the country. No, of course not. But anyway, suppose you got, suppose uh, levels were run here in 1962. All right? And you've got a value in 1962. And you come back in 1985. The, look at the difference in that point. Now, the trouble is, one problem is, you know, first of all, you're going to be wrong. But second of all, some things move together. So when they subside, they move, subside together. Not always, of course. But you can actually check between benchmarks it, relatively and be out, <laughs> out the door. So great reason to have active reference stations. This is an Alaska, Denali earthquake northeast and up differences. Uh, this is actually a yearly plot. This is just to show you that uh, this cyclical movement of an antenna year to year to year. Now this is Alaska, okay, but difference is 10 centimeters in that, in that, in that height of that antenna year to year to year, up and down. So here's some of the reasons, of course. I'll have to... Velocities, Again, a problem with a real-time network, but 983 in Silver Spring, movement per year, sub-millimeter. Movement ITRF datum, maybe a centimeter and a half. But look at the West Coast. The gold arrows are 983. The blue arrows are ITRF. They're both moving four and a half, five centimeters a year in different directions. So this is very evident in any kind of real-time positioning, any kind of real-time network. But it would not be evident with passive marks in the ground. Okay? RTCM data is built for networks. 3.1 was built specifically for real-time networks. RTCM data is a broadcast format to transport data, GPS and GLONASS data, to the receiver from the server or from a, a, a base station. There's lots of different message types, but we would like to see, because this is open, generic format, any receiver could, should be able to use this data. And there's a lot of message types being brought that, that are available here. We sit on the RTCM committee for uh, Special Committee 104 for differential positioning. These are really, really smart guys there. And I just try to hide in the corner and keep notes, you know, while they're working. And uh, they're, they're coming up with some amazing stuff just for RTCM. One thing is, is the residuals they can give you. So when you have modeling going on for where your rover is, and it does the modeling, there's residuals of that. By broadcasting the residuals to the rover, they're saying you can reduce the uh, initialization time by 30%, and the positioning is improved by a factor of two. That's really something, as far as I'm concerned. All right. Now probably the final point here. We talked about real-time networks. We talked about NGS. We talked about some of the issues. We have to fight through this. How, how will we, and what's the right word? Validate is a nice word, I guess. Certainly not certify, but maybe validate is the right word. How will we validate real-time networks? How will we say, okay, you're aligned to the National Spatial Reference System? Well, there's lots of different ways we could do that. One way is to look from the top down and from the administrator. One that we're kind of really looking at now is this guy out in the field where you can actually establish a mark of some kind that uh, as high a stability as you could do. We know it's not going to be great forever, but we can update it too. So let's do that. Let's, let's geodetically level to it. Let's use static GPS and get a good NAT83 position on it. Then what? Well, if you have a couple of these spread throughout the network, any user with any equipment can go to that mark that's been published 
in the NGS database, and they can compare the real-time network value with the published value. Do they compare? Yeah, they compare pretty well. You're in the NSRS. So that's one way to look at it. It's a very nice proof in the pudding way. And we're kind of looking at that real closely now. And we talked about that. Uh, a point here, Roy did a paper, I don't know, a couple years ago, I guess, about community benchmarks and validating community benchmarks with FEMA using GPS. Well, this is a great way to do that. If you can actually establish these fiducial marks in, in a community area that would be inside of an RTN, they would be validated to the NSRS, and we would feel really good about it. And I don't know whether FEMA would like to use that or not, but it would be a great way to actually have a nice tie to the NSRS to the FEMA community data. So just a, just a thought. Study areas that are looking into validation methodology for real-time networks are uh, certainly Louisiana, Florida. Dave Newcomer in Florida is starting to work on that. Uh, Oregon, they're using our guidelines right now. Connecticut, Tom Meyer is starting uh, the Massachusetts, um, scratch that, Connecticut real-time network. Texas, Dan Prouty, is doing uh, the study down there that's going to take RTK and leveling and everything. So these are things, these are study areas that we're going to try to garner information from so that we can make a decision. I just hope that you understand it's important that these real-time networks are aligned so they're consistent, so we're using our datum. We can relate GIS data, LIDAR data, GPS, you know, surveying, engineering. Everything fits together. Okay, so we think it's important. Hopefully you do too. Summary of what I said. Um, an easy way out and a hard way out. Easy way out, hey, send us a letter saying we did this, we're aligned to the NSRS. Signed, Roy Docker. You know, okay, well, maybe that'll work. But the hard way out, we hire 25 people with Cray computers and we monitor all the RTN in the country. That's not an easy way. So, uh, we like the idea of the fiducial marks because it proves the network uh, solution, not just the network coordinates, but the network solution. Good way to go. And we have a test page we're working on. So when you have, uh, this is not accurate, of course, this is just a placeholder. But we're trying to develop some kind of online tool where maybe the RTN can submit data or maybe, maybe let them do the work of an Opus Projects or something and submit the, the results. Then we could like use uh, Google Earth, you know, and get a KML file like what I did with uh, GolfNet here. And we could show a placeholder for the network and you click on the placeholder, it would bring up the stations. You could see this, you know, click on maybe state by state or something. And you, and you could bring up the stations and, and you know, you could see a, a, a sign off or something that's, that, that says that uh, as of this date, this network was found to be compliant with an SRS. So something like that. That is GolfNet. 60 day plots are easy to look at because you don't have to review the data. Can you see there's a bias here? Sure, just by looking at it. Final thoughts. New datums, new methodologies, 4D positioning. So as we're taking into account time of the whole thing, new datum will, will give us Network accuracies, remember Dave Z talking about this yesterday. Network accuracies, local accuracies, and velocities on all the stations, 4D. And as promised, this is a page. Let me do the last slide and I'll come back to this. I like this slide because it's cradle to grave GPS. So cradle, we're putting GPS receivers on babies' legs so that nobody steals them where they know where they are all the time. And grave. <laughs> I enjoy this. This is our friends in Australia. We're going to do away with headstones. We're going to put a GPS locator inside the coffin. And that'll tell you where they are, you know, in the ground. Does anybody see a problem with a GPS locator being six feet in the ground? I do. Okay. That's what they say. 
So here's some UTR uh, URLs. I'm going to leave them up as I exit here. And uh, this, somebody asked me about the, the uh, single base guidelines. Here's the URL for that. Here's the RTN draft guidelines. These are the cores guidelines for sites and et cetera. This is GRAV-D. This is a space weather site. This is the new adjustment of uh, 983. And this is the, the, the passive mark adjustment project. So these links, if anybody's interested, can copy them down. Uh, this, hopefully, the PowerPoint will be available at whatever site uh, is posted on. And that's all I have. Does anybody have a question until we move on? Ronnie. Yep, they, uh, and thank you. The, the, the RTN draft guidelines are out for public review. That means anybody can comment to them about them. And since I'm the editor, send, send the comments to me. Again, business cards on the table out there. The best way and sometimes the only way to reach me is email. Thank you.